I'd like to welcome you this evening to the first of what will be a three-part series on uh, social issues and uh, various kinds of current <coughs> issues and uh, the perspective as seen from various faith traditions. Uh, and tonight we're going to discuss social justice and world religions. And uh, we have two more panels. I'll advertise them, I suppose. One is Wednesday, February 29th. That's going to be on conflict resolution. And a Monday, March 26th, on perspectives on science from the perspective of world religions. Um, tonight, I'd like to thank very much um, a number of professors from Christopher Newport who are going to speak, and I'll mention them in the order that they're, they're sitting in. Uh, Professor Don Hutchinson. Actually, this, that's not the case. All right. Um, and <laughs> you can go from this way. Yes, and uh, Laurie, Under, Laurie Underwood and uh, John Thompson and Hussam Tamani and uh, Stephen Straley. So they will all be speaking. Um, I just wanted to give you a sense of why we're, we're doing this and also um, introduce uh, Byram Toriev, who is from the Rumi Forum um, and uh, contacted me and Hussam and talked about uh, getting together and having a, a series of interfaith dialogues. The Rumi Forum, which if you're interested in, in, in looking at their website, it's rumiforum.org, um, is an international organization dedicated to uh, interfaith dialogue. And I had the good fortune a year and a half ago or so of going to Turkey uh, with the group. It was a wonderful experience. Uh, what we decided we wanted to do in, in creating this is really to offer the community and professors and students an opportunity to learn more about um, an, one another's core beliefs in faith and culture, traditions and, and cultural life, and to begin with that, to also ask questions in dialogue that lead to greater understanding of the issues and also of the faith traditions and their attitudes towards those issues. Uh, but also really to create friendships and build relationships across religious and cultural divides. Uh, we have more in common than the things that separate us and, and this is our opportunity to, to talk about that. Um, also really to decrease suspicion and fear of one another which can happen when people do not understand other people's traditions and misinterpret or hear secondhand what some group supposedly believes. And to also be part of a process that eliminates discrimination and hate against immigrants and people of color, uh, a very important issue today. And so to, in general, uh, to contribute towards building greater respect and opportunity for people in the Hampton Roads area. Um, and I'd like to thank you all for coming out tonight um, very much. Uh, the purpose of, of the first panel is to talk about issues of social justice. And one of the things that we did is we sent the panelists a series of questions. We're going to ask them each to speak about seven minutes on which uh, ever of these topics they're interested in. And then, as you can see, there's a mic here, and we'd be happy to have you ask questions of the panelists. Some of the things that, that we ask the panelists to think about are what issues of social justice, like poverty or women's rights or racial equality, nonviolence, are most emphasized, do you think, in a specific tradition? Uh, which issues of social justice create special challenges for that tradition? Uh, what practices and strategies does this tradition favor in promoting social justice? Um, and what, if any at all, does the tradition cooperate with other faith traditions in promoting social justice? Uh, and there were a number of other questions. I guess I won't read them all. What I'd like to do, though, is uh, I, I'll give you some working definitions of social justice, which the panelists may agree with uh, or may want to modify. That would be great. 
Um, but I found one, um, by, and this came from Insanto Nagara, who said, social justice work is work that we do in the interest of securing human rights, an equitable distribution of resources, a healthy planet, democracy, and a space for the human spirit to thrive. We do the work to achieve these goals on both a local and a global scale. And that is very pragmatic. It's really looking at very specific issues, you know, uh, environment, health, those issues. But other people define social justice in more abstract ways and also uh, in ways that might be considered uh, more spiritual, less mm. pragmatic in that sense. Um, Rabbi Michael Lerner of the Tikkun community said, by social justice, I mean the creation of a society which treats human beings as embodiments of the sacred, supports them to realize their fullest human potential, and promotes and rewards people to the extent that they are loving and caring, kind and generous, open-hearted and playful, ethically and ecologically sensitive, and tend to respond to the universe with awe, wonder, and radical amazement at the grandeur of creation. Um, and then I'll end, since it was just Martin Luther King's day, with what Martin Luther King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Okay, so now what we'll do is have people make opening remarks and then we'll open it to uh, a discussion with the audience. Just go in order? Okay. Hi, I'm Dawn Hutchinson, and um, I'm going to be talking about uh, Unitarian Universalism and how they address um, social justice. And um, I, my scholarship area is in American religious history, so that's kind of my interest area, but I'm also uh, a member of the Unitarian uh, Universalist faith, and I uh, practice here locally. Um, and I thought I would address this by talking about the fact, uh, or first of all, that uh, Unitarian Universalism, Universalism does not have a creed. So it means that they do not adhere to a particular belief. Um, what they do have, though, is what they call uh, the seven principles of faith. So I thought I would talk about that because they address specifically social justice. Um, so these are the seven principles uh, which Unitarian Universalist congregations affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person, justice, equity, and compassion in human relations, acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregations, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning, the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large, the goal of a world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all, and respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. So those are the seven principles that if you're a member of these congregations, you affirm and promote. They're not considered to be the same thing as a creed because you don't have to believe in something particularly. Um, and as far as uh, what practices and, practices and strategies that you use, that's what they, that's what you use, you use. So I'll use that a lot, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so that's what you use. Um, use to uh, address social justice. Um, specifically, um, the social justice work today is primarily focused on racism, classism, and heterosexism, um, particularly in terms of how those diminish equality for individuals and democracy for society. Um, and their primary, the primary tool is compassionate accountability. Uh, they enter into covenantal relationships with those suffering injustices, and they use their own power to privilege uh, the epistemology of the oppressed. So they enter into um, covenants with these groups and fight with these groups for power um, in society. The practices and strategies that you use favor in promoting social justice is vary, uh, but they include um, churches at the local level organizing and or marching at political rallies, uh, the formation of official statements of beliefs and social justice issues, uh, voter registration drives, supporting the formulation of nonprofit uh, organizations that could work to end specific injustices that they see in society, 
um, signing petitions for legislation on social justice issues. Um, and also, one of the things that I noticed as I was kind of perusing, um, they also do something which they call bearing witness. Um, and this is something where they will sit with people who are suffering injustice and bring, they call it public attention mm -hmm. to the issue and make official public statements um, as well. Um, as far as how you use cooperate with other faith traditions, um, this, I can only speak to the, our local community. Uh, we are part of the LINK, uh, which is an interfaith uh, organization uh, that's a service organization. We also ho host PORT, which is part of LINK. It's a winter uh, shelter. Um, we also host uh, Friday night dinners at St. Paul's Episcopal Church um, and Saturday lunches there. Uh, we witness to LGBTQQIA, which is a very long way of saying uh, that we're involved in inequalities for the gay uh, community. Uh, we also support reproductive rights, and we are involved in advocacy um, on a whole range of social justice and environmental issues. Um, also support a range of organizations by sharing our Sunday offerings with different social groups each week. We share, we call share the basket. We take half of the basket and we choose different groups that we can help in the community as well. Um, one of the other questions that was asked was who are, who are the exemplar? This is one of the things that UUs like to do, by the way, famous UUs in history. So I just picked a few that were humanitarians. Um, Jane Addams was a UU, Clara Barton, uh, Christopher Reeve, and Albert Schweitzer. Yeah. Superman? Yeah. Superman? Oh, cool. Yes, Superman. Superman was a UU. Oh. <laughs> there you go. All right, and I'm, gonna, I'm Lori Underwood, and I'm going to be talking about um, Catholic social teaching. Um, Catholics love the number seven, and we love hierarchies. So we have seven hierarchical principles of social justice. One builds upon the other. Um, very Thomistic, which is because they come from St. Thomas. Yes. Um, the, two, uh, the two cardinal figures in Catholic social teaching are Thomas Aquinas and um, uh, uh, Pope John Paul II. It was during his papacy, the Catholic social justice really found a voice in, in the public forum. Um, so the first and the foundational principle of Catholic social teaching is respect for the human person. So that is really the foundational principle and everything else builds from there. Um, from respect for the human person, we get the promotion of the family. All Catholic social teaching teaches, teaches us that we should promote the family. Um, at least in one of the more controversial principles of Catholic social justice, which is the prohibition against um, birth control. And uh, I'm sure we'll have questions about that. It's one of the more problematic areas of Catholic social justice, which is um, um, in the areas of, of uh, reproductive choice. Um, but the promotion of the family goes beyond that. It has to do with the wider social network of making sure that there's a living wage, because you can't have functioning families if those families don't have a living wage to be able to to sustain family life, so it's far more complicated than that. Um, the promotion of the family leads to the next stage, which is the protection of property rights, um, which is an aspect of, of Catholic social thought. Um, uh, they, families can't function if they don't have the material means to sustain their own lives. Uh, but there's a caution that comes with that, which is that um, the right to private property cannot go so far that property becomes an idol. The right to property, pr private property brings with it um, the responsibility to promote the common good. So um, there's always balance. This is very, a very Thomistic idea that when you have a right to something, you also have a responsibility to not abuse that right. Um, so the right to private property leads to the next stage, which is working for the common good. Um, and Pope John Paul defines the common good as the sum total of social conditions which allow people, either as groups or individuals, to reach their fulfillment more fully and easily. Um, it brings us together in community, not simply as isolated individuals, um, but as a whole family of, of a society to spread the good. Um, even though it's a common good, it's not the highest good, of course. He always cautions us to know that the highest good comes only through God. Um, 
This leads to probably the most controversial um, tenet of Catholic social thought because the common good cannot be provided by community alone. It also has to be sustained by the government. And the next stage of Catholic social thought is the principle of subsidiarity, which says that the government is not there just to provide security. The government has a positive role to play. The government must secure the common good. Um, it is the task of the state to provide for the defense and preservation of common goods for all individuals within that society and to safeguard those goods that cannot be safeguarded by market forces. So according to Catholic social thought, um, the government is morally required to provide a safety net. Um, which leads to the next stage, which is the respect for work and the worker. Um, uh, workers are not to be treated as mere drones. Uh, as merely means for production, capital for the owners. They must ha be accorded the opportunity to uh, have free association, and they have a natural right to form unions and secure collectively just um, um, compensation, according to the Catholic Church. So that's one of our more controversial stances, that uh, there's a natural right to, to form union unions and secure just compensation. Um, and then uh, that leads us to the final stage, which is um, all Catholics of good conscience are supposed to <coughs> pursue peace and care for the poor. Pursuing peace means caring for our environment, um, taking means to secure that there are no um, social conditions that will bring with it causes to come to war. So this is the, the most complicated stage because it's the highest level and because there are so many subtleties that lead to war. Um, one of the ways you'll see this expressed is that um, um, uh, so long as there's hunger, there will be no peace. This is one of the ways that, that, that this idea is expressed. Um, you can't have, have peace so long as there's injustice anywhere. Um, uh, so it's a very comprehensive idea at this top stage that you have to correct the underlying causes of poverty and corruption if you want to have a peaceful world. Um, it's not just the absence of conflict, it's a tranquility of order that all Catholic individuals of good conscience are supposed to seek, not only in their societies, but as missionary work in societies all over the world to bring the world to a stage of peace that, that it is our duty to seek. And it has environmental components in terms of, of um, stewardship of the land. And so um, that is, that is uh, Catholic social justice. Of course, the, the big figures in it are Pope John Paul II, um, uh, uh, I'm completely blank, Mother Teresa. Mm -hmm. um, uh, where we do really well is uh, um, promoting peace, caring for the poor. Um, we have a, a terrible record in terms of uh, um, uh, sexual orientation, and uh, promoting women's rights. Uh, and I'm sure we'll get questions on, on those when you have an opportunity to ask them. <laughs> <laughs> OK, um, I guess uh, I'm next. Um, I'm Dr. John Thompson, and uh, I want to thank uh, everyone for inviting me here and for coming. Uh, I'm going to be speaking about uh, Buddhism. And uh, when I was uh, preparing for this, I was a little confused. Um, Part of the problem is I have so much material. Um, having written a textbook, I kind of have a lot of material I was drawing upon for this. But anyway, um, <clears throat> one of the things that was occurring to me when I was on my way over here um, is um, the inherent ambiguity surrounding this, uh, fra this uh, phrase, social justice. And I think uh, um, Dr. Rosenberg uh, addressed that quite well. Um, uh, it can really seem to mean different things, and we have a tendency, I think, to um, sort of assume that what we mean is the meaning that's shared by uh, everyone. That's not always the case. Um, <clears throat> generally speaking, I would say, when it comes to Buddhist uh, tradition, th there's a great deal of ambivalence around uh, these sorts of concepts, uh, in part because um, one of the key things in Buddhist tradition is the focus on um, intention and the, uh, <clears throat> the sort of uh, mindful uh, <clears throat> approach one is bringing to a situation. Uh, and part of this is to perhaps uh, get us to look at um, what is motivating your actions or your quests. Is it just pleasure, pain, whatever? Um, 
Buddhism also has such a long and complex history. Um, it has no central organization or single institution. It cuts across a vast uh, body of different uh, cultures. Um, it tends to have a very pragmatic and situational approach to issues. Um, I was actually talking about this a bit with my uh, Buddhism class today. Um, I've got sort of, I usually take a more historical approach to these things. Um, we could certainly look at the uh, historical Buddha, the founder of the religion as we know it, as um, someone concerned with social uh, justice, however we define it. Um, he certainly was challenging the uh, ancient Indian uh, social uh, hierarchy at the time. Um, <clears throat> and uh, he espoused what is seemingly a universal approach to ethics. Um, and uh, he sought to promote uh, virtues. Um, he founded an alternative social practice. Um, the monastic tradition in Buddhism seems to be a result of the historical Buddha's founding. Uh, and he did open up the possibility of women uh, joining that. And this is something that was revolutionary in his day. Um, skipping ahead, um, in the third century, the great Indian emperor Ashoka um, is uh, well known um, as a sort of model of what an ideal uh, Buddhist layperson could be. Um, he actually, uh, after establishing his uh, empire, had this conversion experience. He's something like a Constantine of the Buddhist world. Um, and uh, he uh, vowed that he would rule his empire um, on the basis of dharma, which is kind of a generic Indian term in the, the Buddhist context. It means the teachings that guide one to truth. And so he actually instituted a number of practices and institutions in his empire, which stretched throughout what's now India, on up into Central Asia, on as far as Afghanistan. And <clears throat> he was promoting the social welfare. Generally speaking, in Buddhist history, there is, uh, I think, a great deal of resonance uh, in terms of social practices with uh, what uh, Dr. Underwood was talking about with the uh, uh, Roman Catholic Church, um, a sense of working with uh, the state and government uh, um, rather than against it. Um, there are plenty of other figures I could also mention. Um, actually, uh, the more recent examples that I can come up with is really a, a major movement that has begun latter part of the 20th century and is growing. Uh, we sometimes call it engaged Buddhism. And this uh, comes from a term coined by a very famous figure, some of you may know him, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, um, a, a Vietnamese a Buddhist monk uh, who really was seeking in his work um, coming out of the Vietnam War to address major social issues and bring um, a Buddhist perception to these uh, things. Um, <clears throat> it refers to engaged Buddhism, it refers to this practice of self-consciously entering the political arena with the Buddha Dharma as guidance, challenging the status quo in the name of justice, peace, compassion. Um, it, um, engaged Buddhism is very controversial. Um, it's not just a Western movement. Um, typically, engaged Buddhists address all sorts of issues, um, racial, ethnic oppression, women's rights, policies that promote economic and social inequality, um, and environmental degradation. Um, <clears throat> proponents of uh, uh, Buddhist uh, or engaged Buddhism, Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, we could also include uh, Joanna Macy, um, a uh, feminist and uh, ec ecological activist. Um, uh, the poet Gary Snyder. Um, people sometimes want to include the current 14th Dalai Lama, um, of course an international figure. Um, some of you may have heard of Aung San Suu Kyi, um, uh, the leader of the Burmese uh, opposition movement, a lay Buddhist um, winner along with the uh, Dalai Lama of the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, there are many, many others that I could cite. Um, there are many international engaged Buddhist organizations. Um, probably the most well-known is the Buddhist Peace Fellowship, um, which uh, you don't actually have to be a Buddhist to be a member of. Uh, and in fact, I've been a member of it for the past 15 years. Um, and uh, 
the BPF especially works with uh, other uh, Buddhist organizations to bring a Buddhist perspective to dealing with situations that um, cause suffering. Generally, uh, very much uh, against war um, and uh, racial injustice and things of that nature. Um, I've got a lot more I could say, but I'm trying to keep it very general and trying to move on. Um, <clears throat> interesting stuff, controversial stuff, because many Buddhists have said that this engaged Buddhism stuff is just a westernized Buddhism. Um, as far as I can tell, it's not. Uh, some Buddhist scholars are actually saying that this is what is known as, or it seems to be becoming the fourth major branch of Buddhism. It is ecumenical and interfaith in its orientation, and it is um, making a major difference in the world. So, thank you. All right. Good evening, everyone. I'm Hossam Timani. I'm going to speak uh, uh, on Islam, social justice on Islam. But first, I want to thank uh, Dr. Rosenberg and the Rumi Forum for organizing this, this panel. Um, I'm going to start with a, uh, a, a verse from the Quran, uh, 4135. It says, uh, you who believe, uphold justice and bear witnesses to God, even if it is against yourselves, your parents, or your close relatives. A quote by the Prophet Muhammad, <clears throat> no, he does not believe in Allah, nor in the day of judgment, he who eats his full at night while his neighbor is raked with hunger. All right. Uh, Social justice is uh, at the core of uh, the message of Islam, at the core of the Quran. Uh, in a, a Muslim scholar by the name of Asma Barlas, <coughs> she said, and this is a quote, monotheism makes for a just and coherent moral universe since God never does any wrong. The word in Arabic, zulm, could be also injustice. So since God never does any injustice to anybody. Rather, God in the Quran is an ethical construct associated with the concept of truth and justice. So, uh, yes, the Quran <coughs> commands the uh, Muslims to lead a pious life. And Islamic piety can be achieved not solely by personal or individual piety, but by striving hard <coughs> collectively and personally to eliminate injustices. And uh, that's how the Quran, for those who read the Quran, uh, you can see that God is saying, well, believe in God, by the way, uh, help your neighbor. Uh, believe in the angels in judgment, uh, judgment Day, by the way, make sure that uh, free your slave. So the message came, uh, piety with justice together. It's not just piety, believe in God. So <laughs> this is the justice definitely at the core of the message. Uh, it is reported that the Prophet Muhammad once said, this is quote, whoever takes a piece of the land of others unjustly, he will sink down the seven earths on the day of resurrection. <clears throat> so we can see that the Islamic theological and religious teachings are centered on the concept of justice. And all the duties that the Quran prescribes eventually lead to establishing justice in <coughs> one's own community. Uh, now, the beginning of Islam definitely was a call for uh, social justice. Again, Muhammad, uh, the prophet, when he was uh, in a cave and uh, above his city meditating and he received the Quran, he had questions. He was asking why I am suffering, why there, are, there is suffering, why there is uh, injustice in my society, and suddenly God spoke to him. So really the message of the Quran came more to reform the society, to eradicate the injustices that uh, plagued the society at that time. Uh, so yes, Islam emerged as a direct response to the inequalities uh, in Arabia uh, in the seventh century. In the words of Karen Armstrong, world-renowned scholar on religion, uh, Karen Armstrong has argued that Islam was first received by the Arabs of Mecca in an atmosphere of cutthroat capitalism and high finance. This is a quote. Uh, again, capitalism, uh, definitely there was no capitalism at the time, but uh, that's what people cherished, wealth. And uh, you have the wealthy who uh, kept the wealth for themselves and neglected the majority of the people who were poor. Uh, 
So the Quran spoke against social economic injustices, and there are so many verses in the Quran that uh, uh, about poverty, uh, uh, help the poor, and that's where you have the, one of the pillars of Islam is the almsgiving, uh, free your slave, uh, give your women uh, rights, uh, elevate them, give them dignity, help the orphans, the children. So you have so many verses in the Quran that will speak about justice and promote justice. Also, the Quran allows ownership of property and accumulation of wealth on the condition that the believer must share their wealth. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, you can have wealth, but make sure that, remember, you have to share that wealth with others. So, um, and yeah, the promise is that you do that, you will be rewarded in, in heaven. So, God is trying to promote justice by giving the people the reward. You do justice, you will be rewarded. Um, now, to establish justice and to maintain justice in society, believers must pursue a life balanced. So again, uh, they have to avoid extremes. So this is in Islam is that if you uh, pursue one extreme, that's you, you're committing injustice. So boasting in pride is one extreme and suffering in humbleness is extreme, greed and spendthrift, excess in worship and having little or no faith at all. So in the Quran, God refers to the Muslim community as ummatan wasat, which means a, a balanced community or a, a, a community, um, a moderate community, moderation, middle course. So the term wasat is a Quranic term that defines the concept of justice. It appears in the Quran in the context of bearing witness. And this is the verse, it says, we have made you believers into a just or wasat community so that you may, be, you may bear witness. All right, so now, uh, Quranic commentators interpret this verse to mean that God requires Muslims to be a moderate community in the middle, avoiding excess. Wasat, moderation, is re related to just faith, which means a balanced faith. Um, all right, so this is how to maintain the uh, justice is by maintaining the, uh, the, the balance, the middle course. Um, now, according to the Quran, it is God who both provides for believers and commands believers to share their wealth with others. So again, you get this command is that you have to share. And Muslims believe that God will not allow believers to become poor because they share with others. So in Islam, you have the assurance from God that they believe and they believe that God will provide. Um, so don't be scared. Go ahead. Because at that time, the people were, I don't have enough. Well, that's okay. You can, God will provide. Just give. Um, so Islam concerns for the salvation of society as a whole can be seen in Muslims' behavior after establishing the first Islamic community in Medina. Now, this is another <coughs> uh, um, episode in Islamic history that the concern for social justice uh, equal to piety. So scholars often ask the question, why after going to Medina, so when Muhammad moved from Mecca, when he was uh, chased out of Mecca, he went to Medina, why? Muhammad did not, and the Muslim, live a quiet, secluded, upright lives, worshiping God as they pleased. Why did they attack Meccan caravans on the road between Syria and the north and Mecca? Why was Muhammad not satisfied until he had to return to Mecca and destroy the old polytheistic and economic system? So according now to scholars that Muhammad's concern was not to convert everyone to Islam, but to abolish the system that perpetrated injustices. So this is the main concern at that time, is that not to convert, you don't want to convert, that's fine, but make sure you commit justice, make sure you, you are just. You want to remain polytheist, that's fine, but make sure you um, um, pursue justice. So that's when he returned to Mecca, uh, he started with saving the poor, the slaves, orphans, women, the oppressed and the deprived, more than to convert individuals to a new religion. Again, so this, this is the argument by uh, some scholars. Um, I want to move now to talk about after Muhammad died and uh, medieval uh, Islam, medieval Islam. Uh, medieval scholars uh, saw social justice as the only way to maintain the unity of God and the unity of the Muslim community. Mm -hmm. 
They saw in social justice a set of principles and practices that would preserve the individual in the society and promote strengths and strengths God's rule on earth. A uh, the Muslim theologian uh, by the name of Al-Ghazali died in 1111. Um, again, he, uh, he talked about social justice and he defined it and it's until today studied by, by Muslims. And he said that the ideal states consist of a social being whose satisfaction demanded moderation, avoidance of extremes, and respect for and tolerance of the others. So in Al-Ghazali's ideal state, accumulation of excess wealth, conspicuous consumption, and fair trade practices are to be avoided. Um, all right, now I wanna uh, conclude with uh, the statement that in starting with medieval Islam until today, uh, social injustices are again <coughs> prevailing in the Muslim world. Mm -hmm. And what happened is that according to scholars that in medieval Islam, uh, because of internal external uh, strifes, so the, the rulers focused on, on uh, integration, uh, the integration of the society. So they, they sacrificed justice for maintaining the society against external and internal threat. And until today, the rulers made this argument that, well, we have to maintain the society, but we have to sacrifice uh, justice. And that's why uh, uh, scholars today, Muslim leaders, activists, they say, we have to work on social justice in the Muslim world. And their declarations, they speak to the realities of the Muslim world today. And I'm gonna end right, right here. Thank you. <laughs> <coughs> Hi, I'm uh, uh, Steve Straley, teaching in the Philosophy and Religion Department here at CNU. Um, I'm being assigned to talk about the Judeo-Christian tradition, which is pretty, pretty large, and no one speaks for the Judeo-Christian tradition. Uh, I'm somewhat of a historian, so I'm going to spend more time in, in the past, uh, perhaps, than the uh, uh, present. And I particularly want to accentuate uh, two things. Uh, in social justice. One, the emphasis upon uh, egalitarianism. And uh, the other one is uh, the uh, equitable distribution of, of goods uh, through, through the government. Usually when I think of social justice, that's the first thing at least I, I think of. So I'm just gonna accentuate those, those two matters. Um, beginning with the Hebrew scriptures, the Tanakh, or what Christians call the uh, uh, Old Testament, um, I would say you might have some seeds of uh, egalitarianism, although it's not strongly emphasized in, in much of its uh, message. Uh, you can certainly deconstruct part of the message, like uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, that says we're made in the image of God, and then you can, of course, uh, proceed in, in that direction. And you certainly can look to the prophets, uh, like uh, Isaiah, who speak of uh, Gentiles and Jews uh, being reconciled uh, together. Uh, in the future, um, Egyptians will be called my people. The Assyrians will be called my people, says, says the Lord in Isaiah chapter 19. And uh, Amos, in Amos chapter 9, will speak of uh, the Philistines and uh, the Syrians as actually having their own exodus. So it's not just the Israelites who received their, their exodus and redemption from the Lord. These people had their redemption as, as well in, in the past. So certainly that's a, an ecumenical and, and egalitarian message you, you see uh, in the Old Testament. Um, however, as you uh, proceed towards the Babylonian exile and the post-exilic uh, period, it seems like there's somewhat of a reversion from that in, uh, in Judaism. Um, uh, the Jews, when they went into captivity, of course, they believed they were being judged by God, and there's a number of reasons behind it, but one of the reasons they felt was that they'd been corrupted by the people around them, and so when they get back from the exile, um, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah developed a policy that uh, uh, Jews need to separate themselves from, from, from the Gentiles, uh, even divorce their uh, Gentile wives and, and, and children. And uh, this attitude becomes embodied uh, during New Testament time, the so-called Pharisees, the word means uh, uh, separate, separate ones, uh, people that even separate themselves from the uh, uh, common 
Jewish people, the so-called An Haaretz, the, the, the people, people of the land, because they conceived of them as, as un, unclean. Uh, so you have more of a, a, a separation or maybe even a segregation that develops among the Jewish people, at least among their leaders at, at that time. Well, it's in that context that uh, Jesus of Nazareth was born, uh, born, born a Jew, certainly has much uh, uh, indebted to the uh, Jewish tradition, but also as a prophet, he tends to react against the situation, and uh, he'll select among his disciples uh, Am Haaretz, uh, the, the normal people of, of the land, and, and uh, he will end up talking to a, a Samaritan woman at one point, or a Syrophoenician woman at another point, all sorts of riffraff that was considered unclean according to uh, Pharisaic uh, sensibilities, and have a, a great commission where he'll tell his disciples to go out to the ethnoi, go out to the nations, go out uh, to the Gentiles. And that becomes a central message of the New Testament. Uh, uh, the man that wrote half of the, uh, of the works in the New Testament is Paul. And uh, if, if you ask Paul what the gospel was, he probably wouldn't say what a, a typical uh, a Catholic or Protestant might say concerning justification by faith or justification by faith plus works or whatever that might be. He, he'd probably talk about integrating Jews and Gentiles together. Many, many scholars the Book of Romans today think that's a, that's a very important matter in Paul's gospel, not only in the Book of Romans, but uh, Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 3 seems to identify that as the mystery of the gospel, trying to bring these two two groups together. And of course, he's very famous for saying in the book of Galatians that in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female. We're all one, one in Christ. So strong egalitarian uh, message. Uh, after that time in Christianity, uh, uh, Christianity became part of the Greco-Roman Empire um, uh, and its hierarchical structure in general, the philosophy of the day, the Platonists of the day, Middle Platonism, Neoplatonism, often thought of life in a hierarchical way where you'd have uh, you know, God way on top and God would illuminate the next uh, layer, the Logos maybe, and then the Logos would illuminate the Suke or some world soul. And, and finally, you get this illumination and go down to planet Earth. Well, uh, a lot of Christians became a part of that particular philosophy, and uh, 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 Dionysius and Gregory the Great, who many people would dub the first pope of the church, uh, uh, they talked about nine orders of angels. Uh, uh, you know, from God, you go from God to the seraphim and cherubim, and finally get all the way down to planet Earth, and and then the church becomes hierarchical as well where you, you go through these layers of, of authority and, and the laymen become related to priests. That's what literally hierarchy means, right? The priests rule. And how do they receive grace? They receive grace through, uh, through the priests, right? So, so you have a mediated relationship with God. Um, okay, so the church becomes more hierarchical, perhaps less egalitarian at that time. Um, this changes uh, uh, as you get to the end of the Middle Ages with the Franciscans and, and uh, part of the uh, uh, secta Occamica uh, of, uh, uh, that is the sect of Occam, uh, was a man by the name of Martin Luther. And uh, Martin Luther in 1519 at Leipzig uh, challenges uh, the authority of the Pope and a year after writes a work in which he speaks of the priesthood of the believers. Now, I don't think there's a more important moment in the history of Western civilization than that Leipzig debate and the subsequent work on the priesthood of the believers. There he basically rejects uh, the hierarchical model from Hellenistic times in the medieval church and, and believes that, uh, that individual believers can go directly to God without this uh, mediation. And this doctrine becomes very important in Protestant churches, uh, first with the Huguenots, and uh, then with the Puritans and the Congregationalists in bringing about uh, democracy and egalitarianism, and they will spread uh, that message uh, throughout their, uh, throughout their uh, respective uh, cultures. The Huguenots will speak of liberté, egalité in the 16th century. Uh, but not fraternity. That's something uh, <laughs> that proceeds in an entirely different direction. And, and you don't want to get started on that. Um, 
Well, the Jews in the modern world, when you get in the 18th century, having lived in diaspora under oppression for a long time in separatist enclaves, uh, become enamored with this concept of egalitarianism. They want to become a part of the new, new states, and so they become uh, maybe even greater champions than, than Christians and Protestants of this specific doctrine. I think this is the reason why Adolf Hitler despised them so much. There might be other things to mention, but he particularly uh, disliked their emphasis upon egalitarianism. He went to Vienna, not as an anti-Semite, but he felt the Jews uh, you know, had their tentacles throughout society and they were bastardizing his superior Aryan race. And, and uh, so, so he particularly looked at them as, as political enemies. So both uh, uh, Jews and Christians today are strong proponents of this, uh, this egalitarianism. And next I want to uh, uh, just briefly talk about the economic redistribution of money now uh, through, through the government. Now this becomes a little more specious and dubious and, and uh, really depends on the Jew or Christian what exactly you, you believe uh, uh, politically. If you look uh, to the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, uh, you really don't have a specific uh, a message of, uh, of, uh, of creating a, a social welfare state. Um, uh, there's provision for the poor in the book of Leviticus that they can glean on the edges of uh, rich people's uh, fields and, and gain sustenance. Um, you have the prophets who complain about the rich oppressing uh, the poor. And uh, many people who believe in social justice will look back to that message, although many of them will also admit that it doesn't quite make the step into uh, creating a, a welfare state. Um, the New Testament is even more problematic. Uh, uh, there's a sense of church-state separation in the New Testament. Jesus has a message for individuals in his church, but not a societal message uh, specifically. You might be able to deconstruct his message and proceed in that direction, but uh, you, you're, you're clearly going beyond what he specifically uh, in, intended. Uh, there are certainly admonitions to uh, feed the poor. Um, uh, found throughout the uh, New Testament. Although uh, the feeding of the poor is not conceived of so much as a matter of justice, but is conceived more as a matter of grace, um, the uh, Greek word uh, charis. Paul takes up a collection for uh, the poor in Jerusalem in 2 Corinthians, and he uses a paradigm, the incarnation, speaking of the Son of God who was rich and became poor for, for our sake. Right? This wasn't something deserved in the Christian tradition. Uh, we remained un, unworthy. Uh, there is an absence of victimization uh, in this act of giving. It should be received with thanksgiving. The word thanksgiving, eucharisteo in Greek, is related to the word charis. Okay? So it's not a matter of justice. It's a matter of a, of a free gift. That is, that is bestowed. And you might even have a little bit in this, the Old Testament as well. The book of Habakkuk uh, never conceives of, of, well, much of the Old Testament doesn't conceive of the, of the Jews as being unfairly treated uh, because of their sins. Maybe the Babylonians are worse than we are, uh, but uh, still we are being judged for our, our own, uh, own, own sins. Um, the concept of rights, uh, ends up uh, being developed at the end of the Middle Ages with people like William Ockham and the Decretalists. The Decretalists, uh, they, um, uh, they took the word law, natural law use, and began to speak of, of right. And the first right they spoke about was property rights. Uh, property rights were forged by them against the Pope. They felt that the Pope did not have a fullness of power and he had no right to take away the possessions of, of his uh, of his uh, people, and of course that became a very important idea in Western civilization with the Salamanca School and Grotius and, and Samuel Puffendorf and John Locke, and that becomes a purpose of government for them is to protect, uh, <coughs> protect property rights. I will uh, just in conclude uh, mention uh, the Jews in, in, uh, in the modern time. Uh, uh, of course, uh, Jews have suffered uh, for uh, so, so, many, so many centuries, uh, oppression and 
in diaspora, and uh, uh, many of them today have now become identified more with, with suffering uh, at, at the hands of, of the powers uh, that, that be. And, and so maybe not as much in, as they did in Old Testament times confess their sins, you know, but they, were, they became more interested in uh, uh, recognizing their own victimization and justice. So, so you do, do get, have Jews today who identify with the suffering of other people and uh, for a number of reasons I don't think I really have time to get into. I think it's time to abandon ship. But, but anyway, uh, they become uh, 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 at least more sympathetic with that, that type of left-wing uh, expression where you, uh, uh, you know, have, a, have more distribution of wealth. But, okay. Okay. Well, well, thank you very much. And I did want to say when we set up this panel, we obviously couldn't do every religion. And what we're going to try to do in all of the panels is have various different religious religions, different religious leaders, um, sometimes people who are uh, religious leaders, practitioners, and sometimes professors. So for the other panels, we'll be um, you know, mixing things up. What I'd like to do at this point, though, is we've had a lot of information, and uh, we'd like to open this up to questions for you to ask the panelists on things that you've heard or questions that you might have about a particular issue that you care a great deal about. Who will be the first brave person? <laughs> oh, here comes somebody. Uh, uh, wait. Here, here comes someone with the mic. Good evening. All right. Um, uh, my question is that Dr. Thompson did discuss. Yes, Dr. Thompson. I knew it. <laughs> uh, discussed that intention is a key part of the Buddhist tradition. Do any of the other traditions also address the idea of the intention behind the action, or is it just in the action itself? Well, intention is very important for for the Catholic moral teaching. Um, the, the fundamental idea is that all your actions must seek good and avoid evil. So intention and not consequences are key for moral decision making for the Catholic. Uh, in Islam, uh, the Prophet Muhammad once said, "If you see if you see injustice, uh, take action." And if you cannot, uh, speak against it. And if you can't speak against it, feel bad about it. But this is the least, and this is the least form of faith. So this is the least form of faith. Again, intention, uh, well, action. Action is very important in Islam, so we have to take action. Um, um, of course, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount talks about intention quite a bit. He's interested in people serving, serving God within the uh, inner inner man, um, um, out outwardly, of course, human beings see you, but inwardly, that's where God sees you. So that becomes the most essential, and it's from the intention of the heart that the mouth, mouth speaks. And Christianity itself offers a redemption within the inner man. It speaks of the Holy Spirit, the regeneration of a person. The heart is what's most, most essential in Christianity. Now, how you square that with capitalism and selfishness, I'm not sure. That's not the, uh, the people uh, like the uh, uh, Jansenists in the uh, uh, 18th century began to talk about, well, what difference does it make what your intention is? The poor are fed one way or the other. Whether you have a good intention or a bad intention, whether Bill Gates just wants a lot of publicity or not, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, the poor are better off uh, for that. And uh, well, it's good. Also, um, Jewish law takes into consideration intention as well with ethics and the law as it's applied. So intention is very important in Jewish law as well. This is a question for all of the panelists. Um, in the recent years, especially during my generation's time, um, some might argue that there is a wave of anti-religious sentiment sweeping in parts of Europe and spilling over into America. 
And while it may not be the case that morality is impossible without organized religion, what do you think religious traditions um, provide that is that sets apart, makes it different, like worthwhile, as opposed to being having no creed or not necessarily the creed, but having no organized system of social justice. Well, a lot of social justice um, tends to be grounded, at least in theory, in, in some sort of vision of, of servant leadership. Um, so uh, we tend to not engage in social justice projects um, for the fame or the money. So there doesn't tend to be a lot of either one in, in most social justice projects. Uh, so, so most people who engage in social justice projects tend to do it um, with, with at least some sort of uh, servant leadership mindset about it. And um, uh, I think religions of, of one form or another tend to, to uplift and, and, and undergird servant leadership um, worldviews because they're, they're that extra piece that, that, that gives that rationale behind servant leadership. That we might I also think that um, religions um, envision the world as it could be or should be. So um, if you are in a worldview that has a path and a view of what the world should look like and gives you a way to you know, make that happen, I think it gives a person's life at least the semblance of, of uh, purpose and meaning. So I think religions can offer that. I, I think of uh, uh, both uh, Dr. Sutchinson and uh, Underwood uh, as some good points there. Um, I tend just sort of generically to see that um, the religious traditions of the world, kind of across the board, do offer um, means for um, betterment of individual and community. Um, I am not so sure that it's simple to say that they are going to be to the betterment of individual or community. Um, and um, again, that's just, they, they have that capacity. They also though, have the capacity to do uh, horrifically bad things. And I think, you know, I think many things about that. So. In the last century, with the uh, Increased globalization, secularism, and so on and so forth. Uh, you have scholars arguing that well, there was a, or there's been a religious resurgence with, with that. So again, religion is coming back. Even in Europe, religion is coming back. If you look at the uh, Middle East, uh, in the uh, last century, uh, people started to uh, call back for for Islam. Uh, they tried secularism, they tried nationalism, all these ideologies that they came from the West, and they realized that, well, Islam is the solution, which means bring back the values of religion. So they see that the answer is in the religion, and that's why we see today that the Islamic parties are winning the elections after the uprisings. Uh, so yes, they, at least at that part of the, the world, they see that the solution is in the religion is important in this age. Um, I just want to attack this question. Um, uh, certainly in religion you have both God and the devil, right? Okay, so there's a lot of evil and, and, a, and a lot of good, and uh, sometimes uh, God himself must divide between the weak and the terrors. And I, I thank God that I, I don't have to do that and judge, judge people. Um, I think sector is on the rise, I think it's particularly on the rise in America. It's hard for me to speak for other, other cultures. Uh, Church attendance is a little bit down. I think it happens, and secularism happens uh, uh, slowly. And uh, I worry about the church, the place of church in, in uh, modern, modern American uh, uh, society. Um, I, I really think without God, there, there, there really is no purpose in, in living. But with God, you, you have uh, ideals, uh, you have meaning in life, you have foundation for your, your morality. And uh, so I would hope we would not abandon uh, that kind of uh, religious mourning, I think, is necessary to be to be a human being. Uh, without God, humanity doesn't exist in my mind. Can, can I ask? Uh, what, because there are uh, religious, there are faith traditions that don't have God. 
Um, so how would, how would you respond, those of you who would want to respond to uh, a, um, a morality beyond or without God? Um, yeah, I, I believe in God. I, I don't really apologize for what I believe. I think people should should believe in God. Uh, I mean, I believe in Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, I believe in a lot of things, uh, um, and probably I believe people should believe everything I believe. But that, that never happens. <laughs> My wife certainly doesn't. Uh, so I'm often uh, having a on a number of issues. I had a cold shoulder a couple of nights ago. Discuss this, this specific uh, political position, but uh, I think you need some transcendent. I, I think, like Plato's, I think you need some transcendent uh, ontological uh, foundation uh, for the ethical life, some real embodiment of what is what is perfect in order to judge this world. If that doesn't exist, then uh, morality goes by the way. So. Uh, what about uh, you know, if we're looking at Buddhism or Hinduism or um, Unitarianism, you know, where where it is, it doesn't seem to be the focal point. How would the, those of you represent uh, what what he's talking about? I think uh, the focus ends up on how you live your life and how you are accountable for what you do and how you treat others. So the focus shifts um, from a deity to how you live your life and how you hold yourself accountable for that. And these religious, uh, the communities. Um, depending on the religion that we're talking about, um, hold people accountable in different ways. So I think it ends up just shifting to, towards society and the community and the ethical standards that are there. Yeah, um, one of the things I, I often encounter when I'm dealing with Buddhism is that sometimes people uh, speak of Buddhism as sort of a religion that doesn't have God. Um, that's not exactly true. Um, it, actually, Buddhism has myriads of gods, um, just as Hinduism does. Um, and to a certain extent, when you begin to look across Buddhist tradition, you see that um, this term Buddha is, in fact, a reference to um, what I think might be um, a transcendent um, sacred reality of uh, something similar to perhaps what uh, Steve was talking about. Um, and certainly at a popular level, Buddha um, is venerated as a deity by the majority of Buddhists um, and is seen as real and is the uh, sort of personification of, uh, of the highest moral um, uh, and uh, ethical ideals. So I think that it's, 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 it's there in Buddhist tradition. And in Unitarian Universalism, it's tricky because you can believe in God if you choose to, and you don't have to if you choose not to. So to, in order to address this issue, um, that particular community has to focus on what the community believes um, is it values, and what it values happens to be social justice issues. So they focus on what they can do about those things in the community. Is that kind of like the transcendence? Yeah, yeah. Um, you see this particularly with secular humanists in our community yeah. is that God becomes the social good or the transcendent um, there. Yeah, you definitely see that. I, I'd like to say something. Is this on? Yeah. Uh, my name is Rebecca Wheeler. I'm a professor in the English department here, and I'm also a Unitarian Universalist at the Williamsburg Unitarian Universalist Congregation. And so I'd like to speak to Stephen's question or comment about um, God being a central uh, requirement for moral uh, existence and worth. As a Unitarian Universalist, we have, uh, we speak not only to the principles that Dr. Hutchinson talked about, but we also talk about uh, we also bring in sources of wisdom and spiritual uh, uh, gift and perception from around the world. The, the sources that we use and that we draw on in the Unitarian Universalist uh, faith come from all of the world's religions, all of the world's sacred traditions, all of the world's um, 
humanist and secular uh, and poetic writings uh, in our Unitarian Universalist congregations, we draw on uh, poetry. Uh, Mary Oliver is uh, one of the wonderful inspirations of our, of our uh, denomination. Uh, we look for the images across all the traditions, Native American, um, uh, Hindu, Muslim, um, African, African American, of what is it to live a good life? How do we see each other with love and compassion uh, amidst the hardship of being human in the world? And so we look for uh, a spark of sacredness in everyone. And whether you see that as God or the great mystery or whatever you wish to call it, um, seeking this good is what we're about. I think that I think that they see, I'm not here to say that all religions are the same. However, there, as you have talked about it, there is a strong component of social justice, equality, uh, and humanism that can touch each of the traditions. And yet, in today's world, the stridency of those who are not in that tradition seems to be on the ascendancy. And so I'm wondering how you, as you can talk now about how is it that we can bring more social justice, more understanding of us as a human, as people on this planet together, instead of we're all on our own little boats and we're going to fight anybody that's not in our boat. Uh, because that's the, to me, that's the real issue in terms of social justice, is how is it that we can work together and how can we break the stridency that is um, pervasive in society today? Well, we all have uh, multiple different roles, multiple different selves. We have political selves and we have professional selves. And, and um, among all these different selves is our moral selves, our, our moral agents. And we have to decide what identity we're going to tuck inside what identity. And a lot of the times, um, we put on our team jerseys, be it our political team jerseys or whatever, and we tend to tuck our moral selves inside that team jersey. And so we'll, we'll hide our moral identities to, to try and, and play for whatever team we feel like we need to be on. And I think that's where a lot of that stridency comes from. And, uh, and it's, it's very easy to do that because, you know, we, we, we very strongly identify with, with those other selves and, and we feel like we want to, to, to represent, yes, students, I know what that word means. Um, 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 and so I think that the way to break down that stridency is to really model um, the very difficult role of tucking our other selves, tucking our other identities inside our moral selves, and that is very, very difficult to do. Um, because it's, it's not always cool, and in fact, it's usually not. And it's a difficult thing to model, but I think that's really the only way to get past that otherness, to get past that, that stridency, and, and that's, that's what I try to do. This, uh, when the uh, Lord and you were just uh, speaking, I was, of course, thinking, you know, in the Buddhist tradition, of course, there is no self. Um, in, in, in the sense that there is no sense of a permanent, entirely separate individual that is not in relation to other beings. Uh, in some sense, um, a lot of Buddhist practice, teachings, um, be it veneration or uh, meditation or whatever, um, uh, is about perhaps bringing uh, more awareness to exactly what you're talking about. Um, the, if you want to look at the multiple porous identities that we all have, and that's actually a major common point uh, that I think in Buddhist tradition, as I understand it, that we all share. Everybody has all of these identities we claim to. Everybody wants to wear the pink jersey. And uh, knowing that and keeping that in mind can actually, in a sense, get you to kind of, if not take off your pink jersey, maybe bring the other person into your pink jersey and get them to wear it with you. Or, or 
Yeah, I'm trying to do that now. I'm just going to keep identifying with exactly those things. And uh, that, that actually provides a lot of It's paradoxical. Um, the great deal of common ground and shared identity. shared identity. And that really does, I think, um, it's, it's very practical and immediate, and I think it does allow for creative responses. Uh, I'm going to just uh, read a verse from Quran and explain. Uh, 49 14 says, O mankind, we created you from a single pair of a male and female and made you into nations and tribes so that you may know each other. Very the most honored of you in the sight of Allah is he who is the most righteous of you. Well, if you take this verse and we apply it, that how we learn to transcend our religious differences, our uh, look at the other as human being rather than the other, how we learn to look at the other and see the self in the other. How we, tra we transform the other from being alien to become us. So if we apply this, then probably we can move towards social justice. Um, yeah, I guess I agree with most of what I've heard. Even what Rebecca had to say as well. Uh, I don't have much disagreement with that. I, um, I certainly believe that uh, God is present throughout the world human beings. I, I'm not only a Christian, but I'm, I'm Taoist as well. You know, I'm a person that likes to empathize with uh, people's positions and, and learn from them. Um, I, I certainly don't believe I have a triumphant view uh, of life uh, that, that does not be challenged. And I'm, I tend to be fragmented and an existentialist, uh, so I don't try to wield things together in a simple system. Um, I don't think any of us can put life together into a a simple system, so I like to listen to all sorts of riffraff. Um, <laughs> liberals, fundamentals, I, they all have something to say. In, in what way would you say, what concrete ways do your faith traditions try to meet the other? Um, it, that is, do you have ways, do, do, can you think of ways in your, maybe within your church or synagogue or mosque or, or, or basically organize, as some organization where there is a concerted interfaith effort? Um, we have several. Um, we, first of all, we belong to every interfaith organization we can find intentionally. <laughs> like we seek them out on purpose. Yeah, um, <laughs> because our church is very, very interested in these sorts of dialogues. So um, we do that, and then I mentioned the because um, our faith is very service oriented, um, we're interested in those opportunities as well. Um, but also um, the bearing witness piece that I talked about earlier is another way that we identify with what you might call the other. I don't know if it's really the other because many of the people who are suffering injustice are also within our congregation, so I don't know if it's other, but those who we see suffering an injustice, um, we often will bear witness with them. So uh, we'll, if they need to um, sit in a place where they're waiting, if they want to do a sit-in, or if they need to wait for um, legislation to pass, we will be with them and pat help them, you know, write the legislation, help find the attorneys to represent them. We will do what we can to help them bear witness and to help them overcome that injustice. So it's those are ways that I think we try to do that in our faith. Um, the Catholic Church in the, in the last um, 30 years has, has made much greater strides in this than the um, thousand or so before that. Um, <laughs> um, ecumenical councils, um, a much more interfaith dialogue, uh, uh, very involved in, in um, not only dialogue about interfaith, but also in um, peacekeeping discussions between different faiths and uh, on a more global scale than local scale for us. Uh, well, again, the verse I cited that says, well, I create you nations that touch me, different people, different traditions, so you may know each other. And this Quran verse is asking the Muslims to interface, to speak to the others, to know the others. Again, dialogue. 
Uh, no, in Islam there's no, uh, there's no church, there's no pope, there's no hierarchy. So it's, they don't have that either saying, well, this is Islam is, is, is making dialogue with God. It's left to individuals here and there. And uh, it's happening all over the world where you have Muslims speaking to uh, people from different religions trying to understand uh, each other. And we're doing this here in the Philippines for the last seven, six, seven years that uh, we're meeting uh, people from different faiths and trying to understand each other. And we conclude that we are human beings. We share suffering. We share injustices. And if there's justice, we're going to share it. So, um, yeah, it's, it's up to individuals more than. All right, my question's already been slightly addressed, but within at least three of the traditions up here, there has been, there is either a tendency or has been a tendency towards exclusivist viewpoints. How would you then address people who still hold on to these viewpoints in terms of social justice, say, that it's about the flourishing of the individual, but outside of a specific tradition, you really can't flourish, so social justice hasn't taken place. How would you address people who hold on to that um, kind of mentality towards social justice and their particular tradition? Um, do you have, can you give an example of it? Um, like uh, pre-Vatican II, uh, there's no salvation outside the church. So there's no real social justice because the human is condemned outside the church, and so there's really not human flourishing because the ultimate end is hell, for example. That's a big question. Um, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yeah, I got nothing. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to separate those two things because, um, because the, the church, the magisterium is going to separate them. Now the ultimate purpose, the highest good, is of course salvation. And there are people that the church is going to say are excluded from that. Um, not um, uh, formally, but materially because of ignorance of the one way. Um, but that's a separate issue from social justice. All human per persons, by virtue of being human persons, are due social justice according to the Catholic tradition. So you treat all human persons with dignity regardless of the state of their soul. Um, now, um, there's still the problem of exclusivity that you, that you refer to. It's not going to be a social justice problem for the Catholics. Um, exclusivity is uh, pretty tough. Um, and as far as I can tell, just maybe across the board of most of the religions, of the most communities throughout human history, that's always been the name of the game. Um, just speaking in the, uh, out of uh, some sort of Buddhist understanding, um, <clears throat> the, the orientation that, uh, that you were speaking from, Michelle, there, um, that's not a Buddhist perspective, uh, really, um, particularly when you start framing things in terms of salvation. I mean, that's just not on the, that's, that's more of a um, Christian, Jewish, maybe Islamic perspective, because salvation is not the issue, it's, it's, it's ignorance and suffering. And in that sense, um, exclusivism is just uh, something that tends to foment more of it. Um, so, um, other than just uh, maybe trying to engage uh, someone who is coming from that perspective, so what do you mean? And that's just one way of thinking, right? Uh, well, <clears throat> the Quran uh, talks about uh, in, including the uh, other, especially Jews and Christians. So you have the verse saying uh, believers, Muslims, Jews, Christians, and there is a group that is named in the Quran that we don't know who these people are. You are all believers. All right. So I'm going to take that the last group and apply it to everyone. Again, you have 1.5 billion Muslims, and if you ask this question, you have different, maybe 1.5 billion answers. But to me, to me is that, well, uh, I want to include everyone in, in this to be saved. And this, uh, this group of people that we don't know who they are, I want to apply it. Also, God said, everyone on the Day of Judgment will become naked to face me. And I'm going to ask you about why you didn't help the poor. Why you didn't contribute? All right, I will take this as saying that everyone is invited to 
uh, um, to, to be in heaven based on your deed, not your belief, based on what, how you conducted your life in this, uh, again, <coughs> on earth. So, again, this is my interpretation of the Quran, and we have 1.5 billion interpretations. <laughs> Um, I really think there has to be a balance between inclusivity and exclusiveness. I, you have to define yourself in some way. Even a person who believes in toleration, uh, like a person like John Locke, his famous uh, letter concerning toleration, says, well, of course, we cannot tolerate intolerance. Okay? All right, there goes the slippery slope. Um, and there are some people who think of themselves as, as tolerant, that I, I know that's the image they have themselves, but I usually think of them as, as tolerant, because I know there's always out there bashing people whom they think are intolerant. Uh, right? uh, so, you know, such, such is the paradox of, of life in general. Hi. Uh, oh. My question is, um, how do you address social justice issues that seem contrary to your like firm beliefs, but at the same time they're still like social justice? Do, are they ignored, or do you still make an effort to help those people? Like I know, like gay marriage is one of the issues that we're dealing with right now. Or like, if your country were to go to war, would you like support it because it's your country, or would you still be like, you know? So what do you do when matters of your conscience contradict with prescriptions from your faith tradition? That is, that is, that is very difficult. Um, that is something that, that I have dealt with. Um, well, you, the, the cop-out answer is that you, you do the best that you can. Um, uh, sometimes you have to um, uh, oh, yeah, it's really hard. Um, it depends on what the issue is. So, um, so for the women's rights um, is a very complicated issue. Um, uh, uh, I do not support my church's stance on prohibiting all birth control um, for a number of issues. One is the problem with um, AIDS in Sub-Saharan Africa. The prohibition against birth control is leading to the deaths of millions of people on a, on a yearly basis. And um, I think it's a, a viewpoint that needs to be carefully thought out and is being thought out, as a matter of fact. Um, uh, and then there are issues that are more complicated. Um, do I believe that the United States should recognize gay marriages? Yes, I do. Absolutely without a question. Do I think that my church should be required to perform gay marriages? No. Um, because that would be a violation of canon law in their sacred belief that a marriage within the church is between a man and a woman. Does my church have the right to endorse that? Yes. Does my government? No. Because my government has a duty to protect all of its citizens equally, whereas my church has the right to make religious prescriptions based on doctrine. So um, you get into some pretty complicated philosophical arguments. Um, and so that's, you can't blanket say, well, I'm just going to pitch my faith whenever it's convenient. You have to look at each issue and say, OK, I'm not a blind follower. I'm a thinking person. And I'm lucky because the Catholic faith is based on reason and the belief that God gave you a conscience to figure out what the right thing is to do. He didn't give you a list of rules to blindly follow. So I get to say, oh, wait a minute. Um, my conscience tells me this. Why is it wrong in this case? And my priest says, it's a mystery where I can go away. Um, <laughs> my rabbi says the same. <laughs> Actually, he, he, he laughs when he says that now, and then we have complex discussions. And then he pats me on the back of the head and says, we'll talk again later, which is basically a nice way of saying it's a mystery, Lori. We'll talk later. Um, but the answer is, you have to follow your conscience. In my case, that's my answer. That was really good. What, <laughs> what she said. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, to me, this is a good question. Uh, and uh, I, one of the things that I think almost all um, religions that have sort of stood the test of time um, uh, do is they really do um, 
when push comes to shove, uh, <coughs> deal with a lot of ambiguity. Um, the human situation seems to be fraught with that ambiguity, paradox, contradictions. Um, uh, one of the things in the Buddhist tradition, um, the, the, the concerns are at least ideally supposed to be not necessarily what is the right thing to do versus the wrong thing to do. Um, that's too simple. Um, it doesn't match the situation usually. Um, it's more of what would be the compassionate response, the response that might fit to the best of one's understanding um, the situation and would hopefully alleviate suffering. Um, and that's always going to be very situational. Um, that doesn't mean that it's all completely relative, um, but it's, um, it doesn't, uh, it's a matter of trying to um, develop and uh, really giving a um, best shot, I guess, at uh, seeking to see what makes sense, what will help, and developing your own virtues in that sense. Hopefully that will lead to it. We make mistakes, like the suffering. Yeah, there are a lot of challenges, uh, definitely. Now, um, there are some teachings, issues here and there that were uh, if you look at them, uh, they may probably contradict the issues of justice. But now, how do you deal with it? In, in uh, the state, again, the Quran or any scripture, instead of just taking the verse and focusing on it and analyzing and concluding whatever you want to do, take the whole scripture, the whole message as a totality and say, well, this is what God said. And then you move on. So really, you, you give different interpretations, you take the whole message in totality rather than focusing on one verse where God said you can do it. No. So again, that's, uh, uh, you have uh, Muslim scholars who are trying to uh, come with this and provide some vision to change some laws or to improve things for people in Muslim scholars. Yeah, please. Yeah, please. Yeah, please. Uh, yes, uh, one of the problems that we have in our society is the number of people in jails and prisons. My question to you all is, uh, what's your perspectives on punishment, retribution, and maybe a criminal justice? Wow. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> um, I know that the UU um, church is very um, concerned with social justice issues, particularly in the prison uh, system itself as it is applied now, and also the criminal justice system. Um, and so they actually have a task force um, working on um, doing something, but the problem, of course, is that you have to work at reform, which seems to, at the moment, be people are resisting to the reform at the moment. But um, yeah, so uh, at least as as a social justice issue, it is something that um, the Unitarian Universalist Church is concerned about. They're working within prisons at the moment. Um, particularly uh, with uh, rights of freedom of religious issues uh, for prisoners and those prisoners um, who probably did not get a fair trial in the first place, they're going in with uh, lawyers that can help them to appeal and that sort of thing and trying to get a fair trial, at least on appeal, even if they didn't get one in the first place. But it's, a, it's an imperfect system. It's, it's a very good point. Um, you also have to look at uh, um, your societal institutions as a whole. Um, if you build a society such that people have no choice but to be thieves, then it's an injustice of the system to then punish them for thievery, um, which is, is, you have to, in terms of promoting the family, promoting property rights, you have to make a system where people have a chance to make a legitimate living. Um, and if you structured your system so that that is not possible, and I'm not talking about necessarily the United States, um, but if you look at places where corruption is so prevalent that you have to bribe 12 people to get to work in the morning, um, uh, if you're lucky enough to have a job and you do bribe three more people to stay there um, so that crime is an integral part of life. 
Um, that's one structural problem. Also, certainly, um, what Dr. Jones was talking about in terms of, of equity within the um, uh, justice system in the United States. In the United States, um, your odds of being incarcerated are much higher if you are poor and much higher if you are a minority than if you are wealthy and not a minority. And until those are independent variables, there is something structurally wrong with our system that must be addressed. Um, uh, you look, I uh, think, very well. Um, certainly uh, one of the things uh, we find in uh, Buddhist tradition is um, to look at and seek to understand the larger connections. And uh, this does have to do with the uh, social institutions and practices as well. Um, the uh, teaching of karma, which is about you know, action and then the response uh, that is, uh, is something that also applies socially, culturally. And so there are situations that, um, structures that are set up that seem to produce exceedingly negative and harmful results. And uh, most societies sometimes, you know, at various times get into those situations. Um, in terms of just more specific stuff about the present United States, um, I mentioned the uh, Buddhist, uh, um, the BBF, the Buddhist Peace uh, Fellowship. Uh, they have uh, had for a number of years a uh, very active and thriving um, prison uh, ministry, particularly in areas in, uh, in California. And uh, you have uh, actually uh, thriving um, Buddhist communities uh, within the prisons. Uh, and I've actually met several people who are uh, um, prison chaplains for this. Uh, and it's um, rather remarkable what they're, they're able to do. But again, it takes a willingness to pay attention and actually try to see what's going on and to, to try to address it rather than just sort of allow things to run their course, as the case may be. Yeah, I'm not sure what I'm going to say about the role of Islam in the prison system, but uh, again, in, you have, uh, 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 yeah, I mean, you have, you have, that's right, uh, the black Muslims where they try to correct things or uh, again, help uh, people in prison, and then you have many people who enter that prison and then they came out or they, they became Muslims. So, uh, again, there is a role in this, but I'm not, I don't have to say that's not. Uh... I think we'll take one more question. Was there? Do you want to ask a in your particular uh, religions. And you, you church, I'm, I'm not familiar with at all, but the other religions, and in my perspective, it tends to be that there are males that are at the highest um, levels of those um, religions. Um, so that being said, um, would the representation and promotion of women um, within the higher stratus of these religions lead to greater focus on social justice for women around the world? Um, that's a huge um, emphasis in Unitarian Universalist uh, churches. There are um, many um, UU women clergy. That's actually, if you probably looked at the clergy, they probably are in the ma majority. Um, and yeah, they are at the highest. Actually, there's very little hierarchy in UUism on purpose. They kind of avoid it to make the structure work. Um, but yeah, and so they do, I think it does tend toward, they were very involved in women's suffrage movement uh, very early on, and I do think that it's the reason that they're involved in which women issues, women's issues now. I think that's very largely why you got that. Uh, yes, my church is male-dominated. <laughs> <laughs> um, 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 although, um, not in the early church. Uh, the, the, the only uh, person uh, officially named it to the diaconate in the Bible was Phoebe. Um, little known fact. Um, actually, not that little known, but uh, it's in the Bible. Uh, but um, uh, uh, would having women priests or a women pope change the outlook of social justice in terms of women's issues in the world? Um, uh, I don't know. Uh, 
Um, I think, oh, for the church. How the church right, how the church handles justice issues or no? How, how, um, how, justice, how social issues that pertain to women and children do you think it would, would change the way we approach social justice in the world? Um, I don't, I mean, I certainly think that um, uh, in terms of the impact of, of childbearing and childbearing and the realities of the potential for entering into poverty um, that a woman has from having a child and the reality of that situation is very, very different um, from the perspective of a woman. However, um, just having women priests is not going to bring that perspective because that's not just a change of having women in the priesthood, that's also a change of having a non celibate priesthood. Um, so that's a radical overhaul, much more radical overhaul. Um, uh, I think that the, it would be an entirely different church than what the Catholic Church is, and I think because of the focus, the fundamental focus on the dignity of the human person and the, and the promotion of the family, I'm not convinced that it would change as radically as one from the outside would think it is, because the dignity of the human person and the promotion of the family is so fundamental and so pervasive, I don't think the changes would be what we think they would be just from that one change. Um, uh, I, I sometimes say to my uh, uh, classes, I say, when it comes to religion and women, it's um, been all downhill since the Mesolithic period. <laughs> and uh, I actually got that from my advisor in seminary. Uh, and as far as I can tell, it's true. Um, uh, seriously, it is the case that almost all major religions, at least historically, have been patriarchal male-dominated, and uh, the institutional structures set up tend to be dominated by men. Um, that is changing, and it's kind of changing across the board uh, unevenly. Um, in terms of Buddhism, the, um, there is generally um, uh, a patriarchal cast to Buddhist societies, um, but it's changed remarkably as Buddhism has entered the West, and that's kind of now having feedback into more traditional Asian Buddhist societies. Um, certainly uh, in, the, um, in the Americas, uh, in Europe, um, some of the leading uh, Buddhist teachers are, are women. And um, there are, let's, let's just say, there are resources within Buddhist tradition that um, can actively, uh, and are being actively used to promote to more women. But, um, like in anything, it's, it's, it's a threat to some structures, as you know, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how it works out. But, um, yeah. uh, some Muslim uh, women scholars uh, call the Quran the, uh, the feminist manifesto, mm. and uh, in terms that uh, the Quran brought rights to women 1500 years ago, uh, like uh, inheritance, uh, owning property, initiating divorce. Uh, so these rights were not uh, earned in the West until the 19th, 20th century. So, and, all right, now, are these teachings, terms equality between men and women in the Quran applied? No, they're not applied in the Muslim world. Women, all, again, many societies, it's hard to speak of Islam as monolithic. So, uh, uh, yes, uh, women, uh, it's a male dominant society. The religion is dominated by men, and uh, women are <coughs> treated as, uh, again, they have no role in, 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 uh, in the society. Uh, but you have, uh, you have movements. You have, uh, in Egypt, uh, the first Muslim feminist movement to, to lead the change, change the laws, give women more rights, uh, education, jobs. Uh, again, scholars. They are trying, most women scholars and men, they are trying to uh, change the interpretation of the Quran, give it a, uh, what they call it, liberatory interpretation rather than patriarchal interpretation. Means we don't want to give it feminist, we don't want a patriarchal interpretation, but give it an interpretation that is neutral. 
Um, all right, so again, in the, in the Muslim world today, you see that uh, women are treated as class, certain class citizens, they're not allowed to drive, like in Saudi Arabia. And then, uh, just uh, last week, you have women in Saudi Arabia, they are trying to make, a, to, to bring a new law to allow women to, uh, and thanks to Facebook, so they are putting all these on Facebook. <laughs> so, I want to give you an example that uh, in Pakistan, another Muslim country, where uh, the Prime Minister was a female, so you see the contrast between the Muslim and again, it's uh, it's interpretation and it's culture. It's the culture. So Islam gave women rights and equality, but it's up to the people. It's up to the culture. It's it's interpretation and uh, yeah, that's the what people still struggling with. Yeah, I'm a member of uh, a mainline denomination, a Lutheran uh, church, ELCA, and we we've had women women preachers for for years. Um, although I must say there's still the tendency uh, to prefer males uh, and, and to hire, hire males so there isn't uh, an absolute egalitarianism within our, within our fellowship. Um, uh, I think uh, female pastors will certainly share, uh, change the paradigm of what it means to be a pastor, uh, uh, more of a shepherd, what the Latin word means, uh, perhaps bringing more nurturing to the fellowship. Men, such as myself, uh, um, and even my current pastor tends to be a little more authoritative in, into teaching, and uh, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, bringing uh, the sexes together more within the fellowship will, uh, uh, you know, change change that uh, paradigm. I know it does in our, our Sunday school class. I, uh, years ago, I, I used to be more and more of a lecturer, and, uh, uh, you know, and it clearly changed. Uh, 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 because of, of the women in the, in the fellowship, and so we become more more of a community um, because of that. Um, one of the things, maybe not now, but for the next time we get together, we've been really talking about religions as, as you said, sort of as monoliths, mm -hmm. and it's interesting to talk about sort of the fun, maybe the fundamentalist part of your religion, uh, or the more conservative, and then the more liberal. There are times that I think that the fundamentalist parts of almost all religions agree with each other more than they agree yeah. with the more liberal people in their own religion. And vice versa. And, and vice versa. So it might be interesting to look at things that way. And one more question? Uh, my question is more of a curiosity as to what is something you would say is a um, Mis is misunderstood or misrepresented about your religion by those who are not members of it? Oh, I have a good one for mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, people who um, first hear about Unitarian Universalism, including my mother who tried to explain it to me before I knew what it was, think that Unitarian Universalists don't believe anything. That's the, the most commonly misunderstood thing. And we actually believe lots of things, uh, lots. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, um, so that's the most commonly misunderstood thing, I think. Oh, where do I start? <laughs> okay. We don't worship statues. We, <laughs> we are Christian. I'm pretty sure that guy down front is Jesus. Um, we don't worship Mary. Those are the big three. We like threes too. So. Um, not all Buddhists are monks. <laughs> uh, well, I, there's nothing that is mis misunderstood about this. <laughs> well, of course, the idea that well, uh, the Quran or the teaching promote violence. That's, again, the name Islam means peace, the meaning of peace. And, uh, the other one that Islam uh, cannot be democ democratic, which means Muslim side cannot democratize because they have laws from God. Well, even in the Quran, we have verse saying, if you want to make a decision, you have to consult among each other, which means a one person cannot make it, which means it's democratic. So it's in the principle of Islam that democracy is important. And this is also misunderstood. So I have to stop you. <laughs> Um, yeah, difficult question. Uh, maybe there's a difference between Luther and Lutheranism. You can't confuse the two uh, together. Uh, Luther, at the end of his life, is one example, uh, wrote a horrible 
anti-Semitic uh, uh, treatise against the Jews and their lies. Uh, but that work was condemned by the church at that time for Melanchthon to Oceaner, so it didn't represent uh, uh, that of the church. Uh, so anyway, there's always that dichotomy. Uh, sometimes Lutheranism goes in that direction, and I prefer them go back to the original inspiration of Luther, and uh, Lutheranism becomes an orthodoxy, uh, and uh, often a dead orthodoxy in the 16th and 17th centuries, so it lo loses that, that vibrant, uh, uh, fresh uh, unction uh, that the Reformation was so, so much about. Okay, thank you. Uh, if you enjoyed this, please come back on Leap Day, uh, which is uh, February 29th, and we're going to talk about conflict resolution and peace, and I'd like to thank all of our speakers. Thank you.